Hey, welcome everybody. Welcome back to the MIT Category Seminar. Today we have Evan Patterson, who's going to talk to us uh, about, well, categorical probability and statistics. So we're going to hear uh, his talk about uh, the algebra of statistical theories and models. Thanks, fellow. Yeah, so um, this is um, work that I did uh, primarily for my thesis, which I defended um, about a month, month and a half ago. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about a project to um, try to understand um, statistical models from the viewpoint of categorical logic. So Uh, I'm sorry, Evan, you're muted. Could you please? Okay. Uh, Am I good now? Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, th the general viewpoint for this is to try to understand statistical models in a structuralist kind of way. So, so this means that statistical models are not uh, black boxes, but they have meaningful internal structure, which is often of interest in particular applications and sciences. Um, Another aspect about statistical models is that contrary to the idea that you might get from like a introductory textbook, like they're not actually uniquely determined by um, like the kind of data that you have. They're often different competing models and those models bear meaningful relationships to each other. Um, and finally, um, although sometimes models are purely phenomenological, that is they're just sort of um, written down because they seem to fit the data, um, they're often mot motivated by at least, or maybe even more strongly related to a more general theory that one's trying to investigate. Okay, so um, the goal of this project is to understand the, the first two points, at least, um, by categorical logic. Um, the third, not, not so much. Maybe I'll say a little bit about it about, at the end. Okay, so... Um, so in, in a classical sense, a statistical model is usually defined to be a parameterized family of probability distributions on a common uh, space X, which is called the sample space. So for every um, point in your parameter space, you get a distribution on the sample space. Um, and then, you know, we think of a model like this as being a data generating mechanism. So there's some unknown parameter. Um, which defines a probability distribution that generates data. And then given a sample of that data, uh, the aim of statistical inference is to invert, at least approximately, almost always approximately, th this mechanism. Okay, so that's what statistics is all about in, in a nutshell. And this, uh, this simple formalism that I just introduced, um, it goes back um, at least to Abraham Wald, so to his um, statistical decision theory, which, is one of the, which was the early framework to sort of formalize theoretical statistics in, a, in kind of a general way. And within this uh, formalism, you can already do a fair number of things. You can, you know, even though this definition of a statistical model is very minimal, you can already define concepts like sufficiency and ancillarity and establish certain uh, basic uh, generic results such as like the Neyman Fisher factorization criterion or Basu's theorem. And uh, recently, Tobias Frist has shown that actually a lot of these definitions and abstract results can be reproduced in a purely uh, synthetic setting of, of Markov kernels, so uh, or Markov categories. So we'll say more about those later. Um, and that's quite remarkable. Uh, nevertheless, this uh, classical definition of statistics is uh, abstracting away from a lot of essential things. So by the way that this um, family probability distributions is defined as having no further structure, that's essentially treating the model as a black box, at least as far as the mathematical formalism is concerned. And moreover, it doesn't really provide any guidance at all on how one might model or formalize relationships between different models. Okay, so if we'd like to do those things, I think it's natural to ask whether um, logic um, can help uh, in formalizing this structure. And uh, that's certainly not an, a new idea to try to understand how mathematical logic is connected to um, scientific 
models in science or, or in, and even statistical models specifically. So here's um, uh, Patrick Supps writing in 1961. He says, I claim that the concept of model in the sense of Tarski may be used without distortion and as a fundamental concept in all of the disciplines. In this, it, I, in this sense, I would assert that the concept of the model is the same in mathematics and the empirical sciences. The difference to be found in these disciplines is to be found in their use of the concept. So he's saying here that the notion of model that Tarski introduced and which is fundamental in mathematical logic can also be implied to empirical models with the understanding that, however, the, the way that those models are used or derived is different, but the underlying concept concepts are, are closely aligned. So this, this led to a viewpoint uh, mainly within the philosophy of, within the philosophy of science called the semantic view of scientific theories. And there are a lot of different flavors of it. Um, in Subs's flavor, the idea is to axiomatize a scientific theory um, using a set theoretical predicate. Um, but from, from the, the viewpoint of, of this work, there are a number of difficulties with this. First of all, despite the fact that um, Subs was, um, among other things, a statistician, subsequent workers on this, on this uh, viewpoint did not really pay a lot of attention to statistics. So that aspect of it was never really developed. Um, the um, working sort of purely in like in set theory like subs did um, is sort of awkward because it requires one to encode into set theory all the parts of of real analysis and probability that, that you need but i think most importantly that way of thinking about things does not directly provide a lot of guidance on how to make sense of relationships between different logical theories um, and this is where I think um, category theory, specifically category, categorical logic starts to come in. So in his uh, seminal uh, PhD thesis in 1963, Lavier uh, achieved a so-called algebraization of logic. And so what, what happened in this setup is that logical theories, traditionally conceived of as purely syntactical objects, are replaced by certain kinds of um, categories. And as a result of this, the classic distinction between syntax and semantics is, is blurred. And this change in viewpoint has a lot of important consequences. Um, I think all, all of which will be relevant to, to us. So um, from this viewpoint, logical theories become, they're algebraic objects, so they become invariant to changes in the way that they're presented. Um, the idea of functorial semantics, um, which follows from this, a lot, makes it really easy to get semantics outside of the traditional setting of sets and functions, which for probabilistic settings is really important. So we're not gonna be working in the category of sets and functions, we'll be working in the category of Markov kernels. Okay. It also has sort of a plug and play aspect, right? So category theory provides lots of different algebraic gadgets and it's sort of easy to assemble these together into um, custom or unor unorthodox logical systems and we'll exploit that. And finally, once you've turned logical theories into algebraic structures, well then they have morphisms just like any other kind of algebraic structure and we'll use those to formalize the relationships between statistical theories and models. Okay, so, so here is sort of an overview of how this picture sees statistics as fitting in with um, ca categorical logic. So um, um, statistical theories are going to be a certain kind of uh, category. Um, and then functors out of those uh, theories uh, will be statistical models. And finally, natural transformations between those will be morphism statistical models. Okay, so this is extending sort of the, the famous dictionary of, of categorical logic. Okay, so to try to put this in, in context a little more, so traditionally, categorical logic begins as it did in Lavier's work with the study of algebraic theories. So these correspond to Cartesian categories or finite products categories. And um, 
a lot of uh, an enormous amount of work in categorical logic has come from e extending these kinds of theories to richer logical uh, and type theoretic settings. So in one direction, you can start developing regular logic and then um, coherent logic and eventually reach uh, toposes and so forth. In another direction, you can start to develop uh, the, the type lambda calculus, which corresponds to Cartesian closed categories, and there's a whole line of work in that direction as well. So in this work, we're sort of branching off into a different direction of the, of the family tree. So we're going to be working, instead of with Cartesian categories, with Markov categories. So these are actually weaker than, than um, Cartesian categories because they allow non-determinism. And then we're also going to be attaching to that some additional linear algebraic structure to uh, capture um, the, in, in order to be able to talk about a lot of commonly used statistical models. Okay, so let me give an informal example of this, which I'll return to, to uh, later. So um, a, a linear model would ordinarily be defined in this way. You would say that given a design matrix, which has n rows and p columns, where n is the number of observation, p is the predictors. Um, a linear model would be a uh, normal sample drawn with mean of the design matrix times some unknown um, param param coefficients or parameters beta, and then having a, I, and then having a, a, a spherical covariance de determined by this uh, variance parameter. Okay. And so what we'll say is that there's, a, there's a, actually a theory behind this, a theory in the sense of categorical logic. And it is, so it's a certain kind of uh, category and it's generated by um, some objects and some morphisms. And then moreover, there's also a stipulated sampling morphism, which looks like this. So that's sort of capturing the sampling distribution in terms of the generators and we can see the design matrix X here in this simple example, as well as Q, which represents the random component of the model. This would be the, uh, typically the, the isotropic uh, Gaussian. Okay, and then having said that, a linear model then becomes a functor, sorry, that thing is blocking the text. A linear model becomes a functor from this theory into this category stat of Markov kernels, which we'll see. Okay. So that is um, the, the introduction. Um, and so now we're gonna start to, to um, develop um, some of these ideas in a bit more detail. So- uh, um, Sorry, I, Evan? Yes. How, uh, I forgot to ask you before, sorry about that. Do you prefer to be asked questions during your talk or will you stop or at the end? Um, I think at the end is, is uh, better for me. Um, okay. I'll, I'll try to leave some, some time at the end for that. Thanks. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, so, so as I've said, um, statistical theories will have functorial semantics in a category of, of Markov kernels. So let's review what those are. So formally speaking, a Markov kernel, excuse me, is a function from a measurable space into the space of probability distributions on another measurable space. And it has the intuitive interpretation is just being a probabilistic function. So to every point in the domain, you assign not just a, a single point in the codomain, but actually a probability distribution over the codomain. Um, and so some examples of Markov kernels that are uh, very relevant to this work. Well, in the first instance, a statistical model in the classical sense, uh, by just changing our viewpoint a little bit, can be seen as a kernel, a Markov kernel, from the um, parameter space into the sample space. And I think that the um, Senshov was the, the first to, to really take this uh, viewpoint seriously and in, 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 in trying to develop a categorical formalism around this. So that work actually goes back quite a long ways. Um, in addition, essentially any parameterized family of probability distributions, instead of thinking, them as, thinking of them as being um, a set of distributions, we can think of them as being a single object this um, a Markov kernel. So for example, the, the, the normal distribution can be seen as a, the normal family rather, can be seen as a kernel which maps a, a mean and a variance 
to the normal distribution having that mean invariance. And similarly for the higher dimensional normal distributions and essentially any other parametric family that you like. Okay, so there are two fundamental things that you can do um, with Markov kernels, um, um, basic building blocks. So you can compose them, um, which has a natural um, probabilistic interpretation. Um, uh, but we can think of this as just generalizing composition of functions. Um, and then there's also the independent product. So where at, at given two Markov kernels, you get the independent product by at every pair of points, you take the product distribution um, in the codomains. Okay. So these uh, two things give the category of of Markov kernels, the structure of a symmetric monodal category. Um, there's also a supply of commutative comonoids, which allow um, data to be duplicated or discarded. Um, and having set this up, um, one sees that this category obeys all the laws of the Cartesian category, except a sing except a one. So the, the, the law of, of a Cartesian category that basically um, morphisms preserve copying um, does not hold. And that is a reflection of non-determinism as an essential property of this category. So, and in fact, you can show that if your Markov kernels are, are reasonably well behaved, then this equation will hold if and only if um, they're deterministic, meaning that they essentially are just functions. And um, so um, this, viewpoint leads to the idea of a Markov category. So I believe Fritz coined the, this term fairly recently, but the idea goes back um, longer than that. It's been studied by a number of people under, under different names. Um, and so in a, a Markov category is defined to be a symmetric monodal category with a supply of the commutative comonids, such that every morphism preserves the deleting operation, but as we've seen, not necessarily copying, okay? And you can express a number of different probabilistic um, constructions um, within a Markov category. So having seen this proposition, it's natural to turn that around into a definition and say that a um, morphism in a Markov category is deterministic if it preserves copying, okay? Um, and then in addition to that, one can express a, a, a fair amount of other things. So different notions of conditional independence and exchangeability you can express um, the no notion of disintegration, um, which is essentially a form of, of, Bayes, of Bayes rule. Um, so very important in Bayesian inference. And um, as I mentioned a bit earlier, you can actually formulate a number of notions of statistical decision theory, such as sufficiency, ancillarity, and so on within this framework. So despite its minimalism, it is surprisingly uh, useful. Um, nevertheless, if we want to actually specify a concrete um, statistical model of the sort that, um, not sort of like a, a very general class of models, but a more um, concrete one, usually we need some more structure than this. So uh, most of classic applied statistics is happening in Euclidean space or in certain structured subsets of that. So um, in affine subspaces, in um, convex cones, so most importantly the non-negative reals, or it's the relevant generalization, generalization in higher dimensions here is the positive semi-definite cone. That's where variance matrices live, um, um, or in convex sets. So, you know, the unit interval or the in higher dimensions of the simplex. So this is where you know the parameters of the uh, multinomial um, distribution live. And then also um, some discrete spaces, particularly um, the natural numbers so that you can count things, right? So basic stuff that, that we need in order to set up a lot of models, okay? And these different spaces can be seen uh, to form basically a lattice um, where sort of the, the most structured spaces are vector spaces and the least structured ones are sets. Uh, and then there are these intermediate spaces um, where the, the affine spaces, the conical spaces, uh, the convex spaces, and um, the, the monoids live. Okay. And so 
this can be uh, turned around. So we want to try to, to formalize some of these property, some of these spaces in a purely algebraic way. Okay, so what we're going to do is sort of to turn the arrows around to get um, and, and see that the, the theories, which in this case are, are props corresponding to these different structures, um, form this, uh, this dual lattice. And, and so we, we will, with this example in mind, we're going to um, generalize slightly the notion of supply that um, Fong and Spivak um, in, introduced to allow um, uh, supplying a, a, a lattice of props in a symmetric monona category as opposed to just one. So we'll say that um, a supply of a, of a semi-lattice like this um, in a symmetric monona category consists of uh, monoid um, homomorphism um, on the objects of C into this, into this lattice where the, so, so basically what we're saying here is that when you take the product of two um, the mineral product of two objects and the structure that they get should be the the join of the the structure of those two objects right so so for example like if you take the the product of a um, uh, like an affine space um, with a conical one you should get um, a, a convex space um, so that's for just formalizing that idea and having set that up, we will say that a linear algebraic Markov category is an SMC that's supplying this, this lattice of props in such a way that it's a, a Markov category. So this is a way of attaching this, this extra linear algebraic structure to it. And basically like any other kind of category, they, these categories come in the small, so as small categories, and, and these will be the, the better part of statistical theories. And they also come in the large, and, and that's going to play the role of, of, of semantics um, in order to define statistical models. So we'll, let's start with that, with the second one. So the main, so there are different ways to set up this kind of category. This, this one is um, a very a simple way to, to do it that, that just uses an ambient vector space structure, although there, there are other ways. So, here we're going to, in this Markov category stat, we're going to say that the objects are pairs of finite dimensional real vector spaces um, together with a measurable uh, subset of that. And then the morphisms are just going to be the Markov kernels between the, the second parts, so between those subsets. And having done that, we can define um, a symmetric monoidal structure on objects um, will be the Cartesian, the set theoretic Cartesian product, and um, uh, on morphisms, which we're going to take the independent product, which we saw earlier, and then it's now pretty easy to define the supply. We'll just say that you know a particular object has the st the structure of a convex space or a affine space or what have you, depending on whether it's closed under convex combinations or affine combinations or, or whatever kinds of combinations are appropriate to that structure. Okay. So let's, let's start to look at what some of the uh, morphisms in this category look like. So one thing that should be said um, that is that actually the, the, the linear Markov kernels are very uninteresting because it turns out that they have to be deterministic. So specifically, in other words, if you insist that a Markov kernel between real finite dimensional real vector spaces is linear, where you just transplant the normal definition of linearity, then it has to be deterministic. And you can show this by analyzing um, the, the characteristic function of this family of distributions. Um, but fortunately, there are lots of other uh, interesting kernels that have related properties that look a bit like linearity, but are importantly different. So, um, so for example, uh, the the normal family has, satisfies an additivity property, namely that if you add two independent copies of a normal, you get another normal with the means and variances adding. Okay, so in terms of 
in terms of the morphisms in STAT, we can express this equation um, algebraically uh, like, like this. Um, and also the normal family is homogeneous in a certain sense. Um, namely, if you multiply a, a normal uh, random vector by a constant C, then the mean and variance scale uh, like, like this. So the mean linearly and the variance uh, quadratically. And um, this equation uh, becomes this in terms of the um, morphisms in the category stat. And so it actually turns out it's uh, that these, these equations characterize the normal family up to um, up to basically linear transformations of the location and scale. So in other words, if I have any linear quadratic, so, so satisfying the, these two properties, Markov kernel, um, um, where the the mean, where, where the first component of the domain is any is Euclidean space, and for simplicity, we'll just take the second one to be the non-negative reals. Then there has to exist a, a matrix A as well as a fixed um, covariance matrix uh, B, such that this kernel is the the normal family, uh, the n-dimensional normal family with the mean being multiplied by this uh, matrix A, and then there's the the covariance being scaled as parameter sigma squared. Um, and this is a little technical, but if you're familiar with the uh, notion of a st the state of stable families and probability, in the same way you can present um, the other symmetric alpha stable families. So the second most important one besides the normal is probably probably the Cauchy. Okay. Okay. So that's a, that's a little bit of what this category of Markov kernels looks like. So let's move now to talking about statistical theories. So now we're going to be talking about small linear algebraic Markov categories. So statistical theory consists of one of those, um, as well as a particular morphism within that theory, which we call the, the sampling morphism. Um, and having set that up, we can now say simply that a model of a statistical theory or a statistical model is a supply preserving functor from that category in the theory into this category of Markov kernels stat. So in particular, um, you get a parameter space, you get a sample space, and you get a sampling distribution just like in the classical setting. But now we have this additional structure of the theory coming along, which is telling us what different pieces are being assembled to make that sampling distribution. So we'll see some examples. Um, for that, I should note that just as in, you know, tr traditional logic, it's typical that a single theory will have many different models. And that's useful because that allows us to, it's one of the ways in which we can say how different models are related to each other. So one might be related to each other is that they actually share a particular theory. Okay, so the simplest of all, well, the second simplest statistical theory is the initial theory. And it's just the theory that's really generated by a single um, morphism on objects, uh, theta and x that have no additional structure. Okay, and then you can observe that well, any statistical model in the classical sense is a model of this theory. So I just point this out to say that you don't, one, doesn't, one doesn't lose anything by adopting this. Um, you can always take the sort of the, the trivial theory, but um, of course it's more interesting to put more things in, into, into your theory and then that more constrains the class of models. So, so another um, somewhat constrained, but, but still quite general theory would be say the theory of NIID samples, which just says that um, you start with a again the, this a generator which we'll call p naught, and then we define the sampling morphism to have to share that parameter theta, and then have n independent copies um, coming from the uh, of the data coming from this generator p naught. So so this 
in other words, is the theory that describes any um, sampling distribution, which is an IID sample of n things. Okay, so more interesting theory. So this is making precise um, the example that we saw at the beginning. There is a theory of a linear model. Um, so it'll be so the underlying category of it will be generated by some vector space objects, beta, mu, and y, conical space object, sigma squared, representing the, the variance, a linear map, um, which is going to represent the design, and then a linear quadratic morphism, which um, represents the, the random part of the model, and then the sampling morphism is given by uh, pre-composing the random part with the design matrix. And then, so to make uh, clear what, the, how the, this idea of a model works here, so what, how do we get back the regular old linear models? Well, we, we assign um, y and mu to be rn for some n, and the beta becomes rp for some dimension p. Um, we'll just assign the sigma squared to be the non-negative reals. We'll take this random component to be the isotropic normal family. And then finally, the, uh, the, the generator X, uh, we won't impose any restrictions on it besides what's in the axioms. And so that means it's just an arbitrary linear map. And, having, and then by functorality, the sampling distribution has the standard form of a, a linear model. Um, it's worth noting because of the way the theory is defined that there are, for example, some, some other models. So uh, we've seen that these linear quadratic morphisms um, uh, in, in general can have other models. So an, another model of this theory would be what's sometimes called a weighted linear model, where instead of having a, a, a spherical covariance, we instead have it weighted by some other, by some generic fixed matrix uh, V. Okay, and if you want to, you can add um, sort of um, the apparatus of Bayesian statistics to this pretty easily. So you could say that a Bayesian statistical theory consists of a statistical theory plus another morphism from the monoidal unit into um, theta, which represents the prior. And then a model of that, we're going to recover something which is essentially like a normal, the standard notion of a Bayesian statistical model. So it's a functor um, just like before, and then one gets um, a sampling distribution like before, but now you have a prior distribution. And then by composing those, you also have what's sometimes called the, the marginal or prior predictive distribution. Okay. So one nice thing about this formalism is that having set up this abstract stuff, one uh, gets for free essentially the notion of a homomorphism between statistical models, um, which is not something that's often considered in statistics. So namely a homomorphism between two models, which we recall are just functors, is a monoidal natu natural transformation between them. And what, one important thing to know is that we, you can check that the components of these natural transformations have to be supply homomorphisms. So in particular, that means that they have to be um, deterministic, um, which usually makes sense. So for example, let's look at what the uh, morphisms of the linear model are. So if I have two models, M and M prime, which are both linear models, that is to say they're still kind of the standard models of the theory of a linear model, and then the corresponding design matrices are XM and XM prime. Um, then you can check that uh, a model homomorphism is uniquely determined uh, by only two of its components. Namely, there's a linear transformation A of the, of the uh, sam sample space and another linear transformation B of the uh, parameters and they need to satisfy two properties. Um, the, trans the transformation of the samples needs to um, be what's sometimes called like uh, 
it's like proportional to a semi-orthogonal matrix or something like that. Ba basically, this is what's needed to preserve the spherical uh, covariance structure. And, and then the two design matrices have to be intertwined um, by, by these linear transformations. So in particular, this gives a notion of isomorphism of, of linear models. Um, so that only happens according to this setup when they have uh, equal dimensions, or that makes sense. And then in that case, an isomorphism is uniquely determined by a linear map A, which can now be described as a conformal orthogonal matrix, um, as well as an invertible matrix B, such that, which makes the design of M prime equivalent as a matrix to the design of M. So that's fairly intuitive. Um, so one thing I just want to point out about this, um, symmetry, sometimes called like invariance in this setting, is a classic topic in statistics. Um, books have been written about it. But um, I, I think there's a number of advantages to, to this account of symmetry over, over the classic one, which I'd like to try to argue for. Um, one is that, and essentially all of these advantages stem from the fact that we have available the concept of a natural transformation. So we don't end up having to assume things like the model being identifiable. I won't get into why that has to happen in the classical setup, but it usually is assumed. Um, more importantly, um, it's not restricted to automorphisms or even isomorphisms. So the notion of, of morphism is, applies to just regular homomorphisms. And because it, um, because we have the notion of a theory in place, the morphisms in this sense have to preserve all the structure specified by the theory. Whereas in the classical setup, you would just have transformations of the parameter and sample spaces and then common sense is relied upon to ensure that like you're not doing something um, which doesn't make sense with the other parts of your model. And then uh, perhaps most importantly, it, it makes symmetry a property of the theory in the model. So it's not something that you add on after the fact by applying common sense sort of ideas. It actually is a, is a property of the theory and model once you've formalized it in this way. So anyway, um, so let me see. Okay, I'm going to uh, skip this discussion of, of equivariance. Um, so let's, Look at some, let's look at some additional theories. So the first thing to point out is just like um, models are um, just like a single theory, uh, sorry, just like a single theory doesn't necessarily, generally has many different models. A single model in the classical sense might have a number of different theories that describe it well. So another theory of the linear model, um, is, is going to, in this case, it's gonna make the, the number of observations explicit in the theory. So here we're going to generate the category by beta, mu, y, and sigma squared like before. Instead of having a, a single linear map, we'll have n of them. We'll have a linear quadratic morphism as before. And then the sampling morphism will have this structure. So we're gonna have basically um, n, n copies and then of the of the parameters we're going to hit it with the different um parts of the design and then apply that to the 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 random component and so if we want to get back from this the the standard linear model um the main thing that we're changing is that we're now assigning y and mu to be r instead of rn and then likewise the the random component is just a univariate normal family so if we do this um, we get back the linear model. So one thing I want to point out is that, okay, so you, you get back the same class of models, um, but now actually the uh, model homomorphisms change because you changed the theory, right? So, so now we get a stronger notion of model homomorphism, um, which is required where, where the, instead of having a, um, an arbitrary matrix transforming all of the observations. We just have a uniform scaling of 
the observation of each observation. And then the design matrices have to be equivalent, but again, in a stronger sense, they're basically equivalent across all the rows. Okay, and, and you can come up with lots of other theories, right? You could, you can, in addition to making the number of observations explicit in the theory, you could make the number of predictors explicit. You could do both. So you end up with a family of theories. So you might ask, which theory is the right one? Which one should I use? But that's not really the right question to ask because um, different theories um, are more or less restrictive about their models and they determine different model homomorphisms. So it depends perhaps on which structure you're um, most wanting to insist on. But the important point is that the theories are related by uh, morphisms. So that if someone picks one and another person picks another, there's a way of saying that they're related to each other. Okay, so this brings us to the notion of, of morphism statistical theories. Okay, so um, if theories are a uh, uh, certain kind of category together with the distinguished morphism, then the most obvious notion of a morphism of theories would be a, a functor. So in this case, a supply preserving functor between the categories. And then we'll ask that the, for now we'll ask that the um, sampling morphisms be strictly preserved. Okay, and according to a, a by now fairly familiar paradigm, this morphisms and theories induce um, migration functors between the categories of models of those theories. So, and the, the simplest, the main way this happens is that if I have a model of T prime, then I can pre-compose that with a theory morphism from T to T prime to get a model uh, of T. Okay, and so going back to our family of theories of the linear model, these are related by theory morphisms. And uh, so let's see what one of those looks like. So for, for the two versions of the theory that we looked at, so the original one and then this one with the number of, of um, observations made explicit, well, to to make that mapping, we can send mu in the first one to the uh, infold product of mu in the second one, likewise for y. And so what does this correspond to doing? This is splitting the design matrix by up by rows. Okay, so that means that the design matrix in the first one should become this composite matrix in the second one. And, and then we have to split the um, random component um, similarly. So we do that here. And then the other generators, we can leave them as, as is. Okay, so, and that defines a, a theory of morphism. So let's look at another example of a theory, which is maybe a bit more involved than, than the linear model. So um, this is a theory of a generalized linear model. Um, so if you don't know what that is, um, you can think that um, if you're familiar with these things that both linear regression and logistic regression are both particular kinds of generalized linear models. Um, so at any rate, um, the, the theory is generated by vector space objects, beta and eta, convex space mu, conical space phi. There's uh, the discrete object y for the observations. So no structure is assumed of that. And then there are these link functions which say how mu and eta are related to each other. So we ask that those be um, mutually inverse. Um, there's again, a, a linear, some linear components here to this model, which represent the, the parameters beta with these um, natural parameters eta. And then there's a, a random component as well. And, and now we're no longer insisting that that random component um, really satisfy any properties. It can be arbitrary as far as the theory is concerned. So the sampling morphism then uh, looks like this. So if you've seen a, a GLM before, this will look familiar. If not, probably not. But 
in any case, what's happening here is we start with the parameters, we copy them, they, they go through these, the linear part of the model. Then we're applying the same not generally nonlinear transformation here. So this is what's taking us out of the realm of linear models. Generally, these, um, this mean function is nonlinear. Um, um, and then those go to the random component of the model. Okay, and so there's a stylized, you know, fact that in statistics that well, a linear model is a special case of a generalized linear model. And so the apparatus of theory morphisms allows this fact to be rendered in a very precise way. So formally speaking, we can define a morphism um, from the theory of GLMs into that of, of linear models in this way. So we're, we're basically gonna collapse the, we're gonna collapse the theory down. So it means we're gonna send both mu and eta to mu then we're going to collapse the mean and link functions both onto the identity. The dispersion parameter phi just becomes the variance parameter in the linear model. And then we're going to leave the other generators as is. And this theory morphism induces uh, a model migration functor in the way that um, we've seen. And then if you unpack what this is doing, we'll see that you'll see that applying this functor to a linear model gives the corresponding normal GLM. So the GLM corresponding to the, to the normal family. Okay. Okay. So I'll do this last part um, quickly since we're running low on time. I'll just say that there's in addition a notion, a, a weaker notion of theory morphism, which allows the, um, the parameter and sample spaces basically to, to change between the corresponding theories. And I think this notion is related to um, Peter McCullough's work on statistical models. At any rate, there's this lax, there's a notion of a lax morph from statistical models, which has a functor just like before. But then instead of requiring that the sampling morphisms be exactly preserved, we allow the, the, um, the domain, the, the sample space objects and the, uh, uh, the, and the parameter space objects to go to different objects, but then they have to be these additional morphisms between them in T prime in such a way that the, this diagram commutes. So maybe an example will illustrate what the point of this, or a simple example will illustrate what the point of this definition is. Um, so in the theory of IID samples, it seems one might naturally want to think that there's some kind of inclusion, say, between the theory of IID samples of some number into one of a bigger number, and that's the sort of one of one of the sorts of things that this definition lets you express. So, so there's not a strict theory morphism between these theories, but there is a lax one, and it works by basically discarding the last elements. Of, of the of the theory with more samples. Okay, so let me let me wrap up here. Um, so what have we done? So in, in this work, um, I've introduced the notion of a statistical theory, sort of modeled after the way these things go in categorical logic, and I've shown how the classical notion of a statistical model can be recovered as models in the logical sense of statistical theories. I've shown how this leads to a notion of morphisms between statistical models, and also how there are morphisms between statistical theories, which can be used to formalize relationships between different methods. And then moreover, these morphisms of theories further give you model migration functors between categories of models. Okay, so, so and where might one go from here? Well, I think there's, there's lots of things one could do. So certainly there's probably more work to be done on studying Markov categories and linear algebraic Markov categories and things in that space. There are definitely people working on that. Um, one thing that I um, didn't address in this work, which should be addressed is the notion of 
compositionality of statistical theories and models. So in other words, like, you know, for, especially in certain kinds of Bayesian or hierarchical models, um, one thinks of them as being composed out of simpler ones, and that should be um, brought out and made formal. And then uh, one thing that um, I'm certainly interested in uh, doing is trying to um, instantiate these uh, mathematical ideas in software, um, for example, by modeling statistical theories in code and, and perhaps integrating them with probabilistic programming languages or something of that nature. Okay, so he, here's the general sort of uh, outlook that I'd like to leave you with. Um, so one question that I think it's um, good to ask is, what, what is really the role of statistics in, in scientific a theorizing and, and modeling broadly. So traditionally, at least going back to the early 20th century, statistics has emphasized the formal testing of, of null hypotheses. And, and if one really takes that paradigm at face value, it almost appears as if these null hypotheses just sort of exist in isolation. And then every paper is, just puts forth a, um, a, a a null hypothesis taken in, in a vacuum. When, in, when of course in reality, um, science um, is not a disconnected body of isolated null hypotheses. It is an intricate web of, of highly interconnected theories, models, um, experiments, and data. And so it would be nice to try to, to model this in a more formal way too. And as you would expect, this also certainly has a, a precedent in philosophy of science, um, not just with SUPS, but since I quoted him earlier, I'll quote him again here. So here he is in a slightly later paper in 66 saying, the exact analysis of the relation between empirical theories and relevant data calls for a hierarchy of models of different logical types. So he, he proposes a hierarchy of models to try to, to um, formalize this sort of the, the scientific experimentation and theorizing. Um, his approach is just one approach. So I think a, a broad question for people interested in categorical statistics to think about would be to how to really make um, more, make these ideas more systematic. Um, so that, I mean, that's, that's another general direction to think about. So uh, I'll stop there. Um, thanks everyone for your for your time and attention. So if you're interested in this, the main reference is my um, PhD thesis, um, which is you can find on, on the archive. And one thing that's in there that I couldn't really do justice to here is a really large set of examples um, covering things like contingency tables, some basic Bayesian models and hierarchical models, um, linear mixed models, generalizations of those and, and, and other things. So um, um, that's what you'll find there among, among other things. So again, uh, thanks and I'll stop there and take any questions. Thanks for the talk. Uh, thanks a lot actually, very interesting. All right, so I think uh, you should now all be able to unmute yourself if you want. So Arthur had a question, if I remember correctly. Yes. Um, yes, but I'm pretty sure it's been answered. So my initial question was, what makes a model linear? And is it the fact that the parameter space is a vector space? But it, correct me if I'm right or wrong, but um, it's that plus more, the morphisms in your category are linear transformations, essentially? Exactly, yeah. So it's not enough that the uh, parameters live in a linear space. They need to be basically related to the the mean of the, the this the sample vector in a linear way. Yeah. That's right. Thank you. So I had another question if I may. Sure. So there's been some work in the past oh 15, 20 years um, generalizing Tarski and semantics to contexts involving metric structures. Um, some model theorists, Ward Henson, Itai Vinyakov, some of those people, um, continuous first order logic. 
I know that there is fairly well established crosswalk between what things mean in classical first order logic and what things mean in categorical logic. They have theories of random variables in this stuff. I wondered if there's been any work on figuring out what the crosswalk is here. Yeah. Um, so that's not an area I know really well. I mean, I know that I'm not sure if this is exactly what you're referring to. I, I do know that people have tried to build um, like first order probability logics and stuff. We're trying to combine the probability theory with first order logic and things like that. Um, so I don't know that I have a good answer to this question. I mean, I think that from, from what I understand, a lot of sort of the um, existing work on probability and logic is, <clears throat> excuse me, more focused on the probability than like the, the statistical aspects of it. So in this project, I've really been focused on understanding um, statistical models. But yeah, if you have any pointers to relevant things, or I'd be happy to, to look at it more in, offline and see if I can give a, a better answer to that. Thank you. Yeah. I had a question. Yeah. Um, so the way I'm thinking about it, all these different wires are supplying different things. So for each wire, I can decorate it, I can split it, or I can combine it, or I can do all sorts of different things. It, with, with a wire labeled A, if it supplies prop P, then I can do anything P says I can do. That's right. Um, but I didn't see so many uses of that. I remember seeing a, a little C. Uh, where you were multiplying by a constant at some point, and I definitely saw you splitting wires a lot. Yeah. Um, but I didn't see that much of the other ones, and I'm wondering if they're like implicit somehow, like the way that a statistician would use these things, they would yeah, start so use those supplies. Or... There, let's see. So let's see. We have. Um, uh, right. So here we're using. Um, here's the time C, right? Right. So here's the plus. Oh, there's plus. Yeah. There's okay. Merging. Cool. We've got multiplication mm -hmm. by C. Um, yep. There's copying. Um, those are honestly the biggest things. Adding stuff, multiply, scalar multiplication, you know, that stuff. It, yeah. um, there's like in the paper, um, sorry, <clears throat> in my thesis, there's um, examples of models of discrete data, like contingency tables, where you use um, convex you're using like convex the convex structure so the mm -hmm. um, more so that's not in in the talk but um so so i can if you want to see some yeah. other examples where no, i think it's helpful i think i just wasn't noticing when you were yeah. using it so thanks yeah well it's it, it just sort of very naturally creeps in there and you don't right. think about it right um yeah uh, hi evan um oh, hi, brother. Uh, yeah no it's a lovely talk thank you very much for Kind of connecting pieces. Um, my question is about um, symmetry, because yeah. you're saying that symmetry um, is not an afterthought; it's actually built in. Yeah. And I was wondering whether um, whether we know that we actually want it all the time. Uh, I, I mean, I was thinking just more, uh, you know, philosophically speaking, and not yeah. talking about the, the category theory. Or, yeah. So, so there are, there are, uh, sorry, excuse me, throat's dry. No, no problem. So um, there are different views in statistics on how important symmetry is as a yeah. principle. So some people have advocated that symmetry is actually a very useful principle for like singling out classes of estimators that are equivariant under the relevant symmetry. So it's, it's a way of constraining the space of possible estimators, in some cases, even determining them uniquely. Um, but some people have also said, well, look, like in practice, it appears that like usually you have prior information which would make like the geometric symmetries be um, less plausible, right? So like, you know, you're measuring something on a certain scale you know, you're, you know, it's not like you're going to treat the whole real line symmetrically because some values are like bigger than the size of the universe or something, right? So like, you know, 
so but this is actually captured by the formalism so like if you introduce like <clears throat> priors into the theory in in the model like in the bayesian sense often what happens is the space of symmetries unless the priors are set up in a certain way that often actually will destroy the symmetries and you end up with very few of them so so um just yeah let me point that out yeah okay uh, interesting interesting and another thing that i've seen passing by so it's i know nothing about the subject so just you know taking it with a grain of salt but i've seen people talking about orbits in 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 probabilistic logic mm. and i was wondering if you have any ways of dealing with um orbits in the sense that that things that you know like you have them in geometry kind of uh, you apply transformations and you, you 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 keep going until you come back to the same uh, yeah i haven't really thought about that I'm, I'm not i'm not sure um i'd be curious to know how they're they're using them in that setting so uh, yeah, no, I have a paper, I can send it to you later yeah. on, someone who's doing kind of stuff with, with um, kind of probabilistic logic and symmetry. So that's, that's why it can, I mean, the, the two questions come together, but yeah, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, hey, um, very nice talk. So I'd also like to understand the role of the linear algebraic supplies a little better. Yeah. So maybe as a sort of follow up to David's question. Um, so if you did not consider, let's say, a vector space supply, then you can still have a prop, sort of prop for vector spaces, right? So then you would still have the vector space structure on, on, uh, on, on the objects in your theory. Right. Um, so what if you consider just um, only commonal supply functors, then for every such, or for every model of, of, of that theory, um, the target objects then will also acquire a vector space structure. Yep. Right. So what, what goes wrong or, or does something yeah. go wrong? If, if well, I guess so the reason you might want to supply the vector space or other structure just like is the same reason that you would point might like to supply the comonoids as opposed to just it, it's that it ensures that when you take monoidal products that those uh, behave well, right? So it, you would think that if you took um, so actually we we can we can see it here um, like in this in this very equation actually so like um, this space of r times r plus r is a vector space space object, this is a, a conical space object, so their product should be a conical space object, um, for example. And that those kinds of coherency conditions are what the notion of supply gives you. So so yeah, I mean you're right. You could you could you can always um, like in, encode those props into your theory if you wanted to, but then you would no longer ha have this this sort of coherence property. So, yeah. Well, wouldn't this be part of the defining equations of your theory? So um, that, I think well, the main difference would be that on, on the level of the target category, you would not start with the supply is already there, but they're sort of determined. The algebraic structures are then determined by the model itself. Right, but you, you, would, then, you would have to, for basically for every, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you could do it. I just think that you would then have to encode like every time you used a a product object, like in your theory, like or in your presentation, you would have to also encode the relevant props for those things. And if you, and you, then you should also probably put in the coherence axioms too while you're at it. And then at that point, you've reproduced the definition of supply without actually using it. So, I mean, yeah, so I guess my take is that mm -hmm. it makes more sense to just, mm -hmm. if, if you're going to take that structure seriously, you should, you should 
do that, but then maybe maybe there. I mean, there are definitely, you know, uh, like for certain kinds of models, maybe you don't need it, and you and you don't need to do that. But um, yeah, that's my take, I guess. So. Okay, thanks. I was wondering um, what was known about Markov categories in terms of they're constituting a notion of theory. So I assume, you know, they don't quite correspond to monads uh, in the same way that a Levere theory does, but maybe you could get almost as much. Has anybody uh, looked into those kind of considerations? I don't know. I mean, Tobias, do you, do you know? No, but yeah, I, it's a very good, sounds like a really interesting question. <laughs> so. Yeah, good question. <laughs> One more question, unrelated, uh, Evan, if I can. Um, yeah. Any notions of close closeness in, in, in the yeah. categories, any notions of internal homes and stuff like that that we know of? Um, so, um, let's see. So I don't know about the case of Markov categories I will, as well. I know that in the case of like just the category of measurable functions, mm -hmm. it's not Cartesian closed. It's not closed. And, and, and that has led people who study the semantics of probabilistic programming languages to introduce other categories that are, are better behaved and, and are closed. So things like it's like quasi Borel spaces and stuff like that. So, in in general, the the and this was sort of implicit in my talk here. Like, just measurable stuff on its own with no farther assumptions can be like very badly behaved. So, usually in practice, you put on some regularity conditions of some kind to to avoid that. Um, now, in the case of like Markov kernels, I don't think I'm not aware of them being uh, of people studying whether they're closed or not. Again, I don't know if Tobias, you have any further thoughts on that or not, but. Yeah, so so those are typically Claisley categories. And so Claisley categories are rarely um, monodal closed, right? Except, I, I don't know if a general statement, but yeah. Um, neither, yeah, category of Markov kernels is certainly not monodal closed. Um, but what what has a much better chance of being closed is on the Ellenberg Moore category, right? So all all the algebras. But there um, the problem is that then we no longer have the co-monad structures. We can no longer copy. Mm. So but maybe a way around that would be to work with the Ellenberg Moore category and then just supply only the free algebras with the co-monad structure, which may fit well into Evans. Um, semi-lattice of supplies framework. Does, does that help? Yeah, no, it does. Uh, um, I mean, of course, as you're saying, topological spaces in general have problems with closures, right? They, they are kind of, there is even a, a page in the end lab, which is called good, good topological spaces or well-behaved topological space or something. But, but normally, you know, normally one tries to, to see monoidal closed structure uh, kind of whenever, as you say, we, we add the constraints to, to see if we can get it. And, you know, the, the thought was that, that maybe there is a, um, be, because you're kind of already doing this very big constraints of connecting these things to linearity, maybe there are kind of other constraints that come to mind. Yeah. To, to have. Yeah, it's worth investigating for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I mean, maybe one way that one can see that is that, let's say, uh, a morphism in a Markov category from, say, A times B to X is basically a probability distribution on X in some sense that depends on parameters indexed by A and B. Yeah. Now, that corresponds to Markov kernels from B to X 
parameterized by A in a deterministic way, not in a random way. So if we wanted something like a Cartesian closure structure in a Markov category, even if it's linear or with extra structure, one would have to make sense of things that are, I mean, randomly parameterized. So Markov kernels from A to X say randomly parameterized by some B and not just deterministically parameterized. And it's really hard to imagine those as corresponding to just Markov kernels on the Cartesian product or monoidal product of some kind. This is true for, I mean, this is true for like Claisley categories, but more in general, if one thinks of the statistical meaning, it would be hard to see how one can get something like Cartesian closure structure. For sure, there is a way to say some nice things about the morphisms. I mean, I'm thinking like quasi borough spaces, for example, for sure have very nice properties, but I don't think it's, it's like a monoidal closures or, uh, I mean, not quite. So anyway, um, are there any more questions or, or comments or follow up? So, well, maybe, maybe it helps to, to say that the Holm spaces, um, if we just take discrete probability and just mark of kernels between finite sets, then the Holm spaces are not themselves uh, probability simplices, but they're products of simplices. So they're the categories and how enriched over convex spaces but those are not free algebras anymore. So then to get closer, that's why we have to go to um, general Ellenberg uh, moore algebras. Thank you, no, makes sense. Ellenberg moore algebras are always good. <laughs> Okay, any more questions or comments? All right. Um, so thanks again, Evan, oh, for thank a very you. nice talk. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, we may stop the recording in the stream now.